Okay, so by the time you watch this, it will be after the exam. And that was probably a lot of fun. And that means you're sitting around thinking, well, what am I going to do about compression now? I've written assignment one, I've done this exam. We keep hearing about this assignment two that's supposed to happen. And so with this lecture, we begin this slow descent into assignment two. So uh, there's a lot of moving parts to assignment two, and this is um, uh, a nice starting point because we can ease in. However, things are going to begin moving very fast once we get to the second part, which is talking about the deflate scheme. So uh, what we have to talk about first is one of the technical points behind deflate. So the deflate scheme, I'm, I'm going to spend a very long lecture talking about the deflate scheme in detail um, once we know all the components of it. And the components we've already seen are things like run length encoding and uh, prefix codes and Huffman coding and also funny tricks for being able to encode things in binary. But there's one piece missing. And, and actually, the way that the deflate scheme tends to be defined in people's minds, so if we, if we talk comparatively about compression schemes, strangely, it gets associated with this component more than others because it's more of a characteristic of it. Of all of the current currently used schemes, um, all of them use Huffman coding or something similar, but uh, not many of them use something like this. So, we're going to talk about a family of schemes, which will take us right back to assignment one. So we've actually already seen one of the schemes in this family. So it's the lempel ziv family of schemes. And we've seen the LZW, lempel ziv welch scheme. Uh, that just appeared by itself in a lecture when we were talking about assignment one uh, a month ago. And um, I mentioned that it was a member of a family. And uh, it, it's a family that began in 1977 with this paper by Lempel and Ziv, which proposed a scheme called LZ77. Uh, and we'll see that the differences between members of the family ultimately uh, come down to how we encode the key insight in that paper, how we, how we find a way of actually encoding that into a bit stream such that we save space. We'll see LZ77 in a minute, and maybe it'll be obvious why it's a bit inefficient the way it's designed. And that's... That's because Lempel and Ziv didn't really design it for bit streams to be optimized. They designed it to prove a theoretical point. So the key uh, distinguishing characteristic of them is using patterns that already exist in the input data in some way to um, leverage that as a compression opportunity. So while we saw that prefix codes and Huffman coding are useful for taking a stream of symbols, treating them as independent, and then doing something with them, this is a scheme that explicitly looks for multi-symbol occurrences that appear more than once. So here, we, we already saw this example. We have things like this. T space appears in two places. Um, space T appears in uh, more than two places. It actually appears over and over again. And uh, similarly, we actually can get uh, entire large sequences like ST space of times shows up here. And T space was space the space shows up here. And so we've seen already that there's some benefit if we can find these patterns and we know how to encode them, there's some benefit to being able to recycle them. And we talked about that at a high level with the LZW buildup. Maybe we prove the point that it isn't as obvious as just saying, oh yeah, repeat this earlier part of the message. There's all sorts of moving parts there. So not only how do we find the patterns, which is a big deal, but how do we encode them? Um, and how do we classify them? Like, what do we really mean when I say recycle some earlier part of a message? Have I filled in a symbol in a symbol table or something? Um, and so the LZ family, what brings them together, their common link, is that they all use when they work to encode the next bit of input. They might look into the history of previous encoded input um, and pull patterns out of that and recycle them in some way. So I'm going to talk about these members of the family. So there's LZ77 and Interestingly, uh, when people talk about deflate, and this that actually includes the deflate specification. <clears throat> so in the deflate lecture, we'll talk about what this, to the extent deflate has a standards document, what that document looks like. It refers to LZ77 coding, even though formally, really what it's using is a variant called LZSS. And it's unfortunate for S and S that they don't get much credit. They just, we, we give Lempel and Ziv all the credit for that. Um, LZW is a descendant of something called LZ78. And we'll notice um, in the middle of this lecture that LZW is actually a, just a clever trick applied to LZ78. So the, the real uh, advantage of LZW was that it found a way of avoiding certain redundant encoding things, whereas LZ78 set up the basic encoding that we're familiar with for LZW, the symbol table and how we add stuff to the symbol table as we go. Um, so deflate uses LZSS. It's not, it, it isn't the, it's not a descendant of the scheme because it just 
just employs it. And these two formats, so Unix Compress and this, this image format I keep not pronouncing, um, use LZW. And they use it pretty like directly. They just use it directly. As, and, and, and it's worth considering that actually the Unix Compress tool was pretty much written by uh, as the reference implementation of LZW encoding. And it doesn't do much else, as we've seen. The slides agree with me. I guess I forgot I had slides here. So uh, I have this style of visualization tableau. It's a bit busy. Um, what we have to get used to is looking, we're going to look at quite a few of these today. Um, LZ77 and, and its descendants are characterized by two things. And they go together because we'll maybe observe you can't really have one without the other, or they don't make sense without each other. So the basic concept behind LZ77 encoding is that we go to encode the next piece of input. So at each step, I'm going to be thinking about, look, here's the next character I have to encode. Here are all the characters I've encoded recently, and here are characters I know of for the future. So obviously I don't know about every future character because I could be encoding for years and years. I, you could hand me uh, a stream of data that lasts for, for terabytes. But uh, LZ77 and, well, and its descendants are allowed to save up a certain amount of input data if they need it. So I could, for example, decide I will keep a look ahead of five future characters. So when I go to encode the current character, maybe I can leverage certain things I know are coming in the future. And of course, I'm allowed to keep track of um, previous characters that I've seen. And we'll notice that we can't keep track of all of them for lots of different reasons. And as I go to encode the next character at each step, uh, what I will do is go looking to see if there's some historical pattern that I can leverage and avoid having to encode my character as a literal. So I'm going to keep using the word literal, and we'll talk about that in the deflate lecture as well. In the worst case, I guess, I have the letter A, and I have to just write the letter A as my encoded symbol. That's it. Ideally, I can find some previous data to recycle. But if I can't, then I just encode the character as a symbol by itself, as a literal. So the idea is that we, the, the LZ schemes are all based on this, on this thought that if we encode a large enough amount of data, especially if it's our proverbial real data, then eventually we're going to see patterns. And there's going to be bits of data we've seen already that appear again somewhere else. So here, for example, I'm looking at the character B, and I happen to know I'm about to see the sequence BCD. So having this future is helpful for me there. And it turns out, I guess earlier in my input, I also had the sequence BCD. So I, I leverage this to um, avoid having to output those three literals again. I can instead output a reference to, I can say, when, for the next three characters, just go back and output these three characters that I saw earlier. And the core idea there is what's called a back reference. So here what I've said is, for the next three characters, starting at the character I'm currently looking at, instead of actually emitting B, C, D, instead emit what we call a back reference, which I'm going to format for this lecture, but not the deflate lecture. Um, I'm going to format it in what I think is the most rational ordering, which is the distance to go back, go back by four, and then output three. So I'm going to say, okay, go back one, two, three, four, and then output B, C, D. So my back reference is a distance to travel backwards and a length uh, of the number of characters I'm going to recycle. And you might notice that um, even just looking at this, before we talk about how we encode this into a bit stream, it might be obvious that back references of length one aren't very much use. So if, I, if all I saw, if I didn't see these, if all I saw was letter B and I said, hey, I've seen letter B before, go back by four and then emit one character. Well, hey, how, how is that going to require less space than just putting the letter B in my stream? And we'll see with deflate that that's actually a weird optimization problem, that there are times even when complicated back references can actually be less efficient to output than a bunch of literals in some cases, usually if they're very small. We don't worry about that for now. Instead, we will see going forward that there comes a point when schemes like LZSS just say, don't worry about anything of length less than three. Let's worry about back references of three or more characters. But for now, the idea is that I guess we could even talk about back references of one character here. We want to turn our input stream into a bunch of literals and back references, ideally as many back references as possible. Now the problem with that is that it's one thing to go into our history and look for old sequences that we can reuse. But you might agree that if we are looking at 10 terabytes of data, I can't keep all of them. 
And I certainly, I don't even know if I want to if I can. I like compression schemes that can run more or less in streaming mode. And I know that the amount of data I could be receiving is potentially unbounded, and so I can't assume I have access to my entire history. And so LZ schemes also define what's called a sliding window, which uh, this um, tableau, so what, I'm, what I have on my slide at any given time, we can think of that as our sliding window. A certain fixed amount of history, that's this stuff, a certain fixed amount of look ahead, so if I say I have five characters of look ahead, I guess there are times I could only have zero characters of look ahead because maybe there isn't anything left in the stream after this letter B. But I'm allowed to pre-cache, let's say, five uh, of the next characters. So this, these two things together, the history and the future, form my sliding window. And it's a sliding window because as I move through the characters, stuff gets knocked off the end of the history and new stuff shows up in, in my look ahead window. So it's a sliding window in that sense. And back references are only permitted inside that sliding window. And you can appreciate that maybe we could design schemes where the sliding window size is dictated by the file in some way. So the decompressor sets up a sliding window of a specific size based on information it's given. But in general, it's important that both compressor and decompressor have the same sliding window, but also that we constrain the size to make sure that our memory consumption is sort of known. It's okay to use lots of memory, I guess, but we should make sure that it's, it's fixed in some way and that it's not going to blow out of proportion. Um, in this case, you might notice we have the same, we're looking at the same sequence as before, but with some extra uh, characters thrown in in between. Again, I'm looking at BCD, and you might notice in the encoded data, I actually did see a BCD earlier. The problem is I can't generate a back reference because it's too far back. So I'm not, I'm not allowed to do that. And that's something worth considering, which is that you can design data that's annoyingly periodic. If you know the sliding window, if I know, for example, I have a sliding window that goes six characters into the past, I could design data that is a sequence that repeats where the period of repetition is just a bit bigger than six characters, and so it can never generate any back references. Um, it's not as big of a deal in practice because our windows tend to be, you know, 32K for gzip and gigabytes in some cases for um, more latter-day LZMA schemes. Uh, but for this example, it's very easy to construct inputs where all of our good compression opportunities are obfuscated by the lack of, by the sliding window being too small. But that's something we have to live with. And so the solution usually is to find a slightly bigger sliding window. Six characters is a bit too frugal. We can, we can do 10, we can do 100. Um, another really interesting thing about LZMA or LZ schemes, not LZMA is also an LZ scheme, but another interesting thing about LZ schemes is um, a hallmark of them. So this is this is one of sort of the defining characteristics besides this idea of a back reference is that we are allowed to define what appears to be a sort of um, contradictory back reference. So I'm allowed to say something like here I'm encoding this B, go back two characters and then emit a sequence of six characters. And you think, well, that doesn't make much sense because how am I able to go forwards in time? How am I able to go into my past but then end up emitting six characters? So what I want to prove with this slide is that that is definitely possible. So this back reference, 2 go, uh, colon 6. So let's decode it. So A, so I'm going to, A goes to A, B goes to B, C goes to C. And then it says, go back two characters and then copy in the next six characters from the, de from the decompressed stream. Okay, so I go back two, and so I copy in the B. Then I, so that's one character. Then I copy in the C. That's two characters. Well, I'll write that better. C, okay. Then I copy in the B. That's three characters. Then I copy in the C. That's four characters. Then I copy in the B. That's five characters. Then I copy in the C. That's six characters. So I did it. I was able to copy six characters, even though I only went two characters into the past. And the reason was pretty simple, because as I copy characters, my decompressed stream gets bigger and bigger, and I'm, I'm able to keep up with um, the decompressed stream. You might actually remember that CSCSC problem, especially if you're watching this right after the exam. Sorry about that. Um, you might remember that CSCSC problem from LZW, where it, it seemed like we had to look into the future to resolve what the symbol was doing. That's the LZW way of manifesting this issue, but it's a completely natural thing to do. And you might notice that independent of how I decompress it, although hopefully you have it, it's, I've been able to prove that you can decompress such a thing. If you're standing here and you're saying, can I see a pattern in the data? Can I see the sequence BC, BC, BC anywhere in what I'm looking at in my sliding window? You might notice there's nothing really special. If you're just allowed to look at the entire sliding window, yeah, sure, there's, there it is, BC, BC, BC. 
So if you're going searching for it and you view the whole sliding window as one big string, there's nothing that exciting about finding something that overlaps your current position. As long as it's at least one character in the past, then you can always keep up with it as you decompress. So that's valid. Um, and you might also, uh, one thing that's worth observing as we go forward is we've reached a point where our compression schemes finally have options. You could write an LZ77 compressor that never generates this kind of back reference, and it, and it could still be valid. It might not get as good compression. You could write an LZ77 compressor that keeps a window of eight but never goes more than four into the past. That's your decision. The compressor now has a great deal of um, uh, authority over which back, reference, which, which back references, if any, get generated. And we'll notice that as time goes by, it's harder and harder to have all compressors generate the same thing because of all the different decision processes that they can employ. And um, so in this case, we need to know that these back references are, are valid and obviously make a note of that for exam two uh, and that it's pretty natural if you think about generating them to do so and that it's not that bad to decompress them. And maybe if we view it this way and not in the weird LZW way, it's, it's even more obvious than it was then. And so the slides are going to try and prove that point now and just sort of we, we watch the buffer uh, slowly expand and I'm always able to the red character is the most recent character of my back reference and as I as I output the characters uh, as I expand the back reference it says okay two to six okay well then get the B okay great now get the C and as I go my the end of my back references expansion is always behind the end of my current buffer and so I can keep up uh, and that's the, that's the key point there so it's a completely natural thing to do um, so the ideas of the back reference and sliding window are common to the whole family. And they're even, you can even see them in things like LZMA, which is a sort of, um, I guess you could think of it as sort of a descendant of LZSS. But it, it's, a, it's not quite in the family. So LZMA, there's a lot of other logic employed. LZMA is a description of an entire scheme, not just a, um, an encoding trick. Like LZ77 is a specific way of taking a stream of symbols and making a stream of symbols and back references. LZMA is a whole bunch of other stuff. It's like BZIP or GZIP. But it's also based on it, and it's, it uses a huge sliding window and a bunch of other clever techniques. Um, and so uh, the differences between the members of the family really are not, you know, are there back references? How do we represent those back references? And there's all sorts of strange ways of doing it. The family does, though, break into two sort of distinct subfamilies, which is basically this example back here, the way I represented this back reference here, is similar to the LZ77, LZSS way of doing business, where I just state the back reference as a pair length and distance. So that's over here. So length distance pairs. And you will become very familiar with length distance pairs um, or distance length pairs or whatever on assignment two. This side of the family tree instead tries to use the abstraction of a dictionary. And often um, uh, lempel ziv methods are called dictionary methods because functionally they do, they do behave like that. In this case, the dictionary is sort of abstracted. It's obfuscated um, by using direct length distance pairs. Over here, it's made explicit by using a, apparently a symbol table. Um, and we saw in LZW, we actually used a symbol table. But really, the elements of the symbol table were just um, concrete artifacts of back references. They were pulling out patterns from earlier in the string and putting them in the symbol table. So over here we'd have a symbol table. So I want to talk about the schemes in the family starting at the top and uh, basically observe that as we go there aren't many differences between what they do but instead between how they represent what they do. And we'll notice LZ77 is pretty clunky um, by standards of LZW or LZSS or deflate. So maybe that's because L arguably Lempel and Ziv you know, had a hand in inventing data compression as we know it. There certainly was the idea of compression, and Huffman codes have been around for, for decades. Um, but programs to do compression on, on a Unix machine or whatever didn't really exist until the, the ancient compress tool, and before it, something called PAC, uh, which used uh, sort of a, a basic custom prefix code system. Um, and so Lempel and Ziv didn't write the paper thinking, okay, well, we're going to design a scheme to make archives of files for backup. And they were designing a paper, they were writing a paper to describe a compression scheme in a very abstract sort of theoretical sense. Um, certainly they talked about things like bits, but they were mostly concerned with proving things about their scheme. And so their scheme itself was a little bit clunky. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm just, as a, just to make sure we don't give them the, the short end of the stick here, they weren't trying to achieve a clean, streamlined, modern compression scheme because such things didn't really exist. Um, 
So what it does is it emits as its output a bunch of distance, length, and literal triples. So each triple is a back reference and a literal. And if you can't find a back reference, you just emit a trivial one. You, you emit one that doesn't do anything. And you can see already what this is saying is we're not going to get the clean you know, set of symbols and back references. No, every single element of my compressed output is a combination of both for some reason. So let's use a window size of 6 and walk through this. So first, I, I look at my character A and I say, do I find a back reference? That, well, of course not, because there's nothing in my output yet. So I emit a back reference of distance and length 0, so it, the back reference contains nothing, followed by a literal A. Okay, great. Um, same thing for the space, same thing for the L. But then here, AS, I, I go looking for AS and I think, actually, yeah, I f I've seen the A before. So my, current, my next character, if I just think about the A, okay, I've seen that before. If I go back one, two, three positions and then copy one character in, then I get three, one. And before you can emit a back reference, you must emit the next literal that goes in as part of the triple. So I would encode my next symbol would be the back reference three, one, and then the literal S. It looks like we're saving space, but we're not. I've really just encoded two literals because that back reference had length one. But given how bloated these are, I'm still saving some space in this weird symbol stream that I'm creating. Same thing here. I just saw an S, so I can emit that, and then I can pull in the next literal semicolon by itself. And then this is uh, space and then A. So the space is coming from all the way at the back of my sliding window, and then it goes 6, 1, and then A goes there. But notice how none of my back references yet have had length greater than 1. And really, I mean, I'm not really doing any compression here at all. I haven't even overcome the disadvantage of emitting these bloated symbol things. Um, but then, and then here, same story, uh, I go grab a space, and then I pull in the L, and then here's the A and the D, still nothing interesting happening. Uh, there's a semicolon. I, I haven't, I've never seen that before, so I have to keep going. Uh, and then here I go back and grab the space. What's annoying here is that actually I've seen space A space before. It was here. I just, it's so far in the past that I can't manifest it. Um, and so what's annoying about that is that I can't even get the A space, which I do have, because I have to pull in the back reference for the space, that's 5, 1, and then I have to pull in the next thing. So actually the scheme is actively defeating an attempt at generating good back references here because of this weird business of having to pull in a back reference and a literal. I must alternate literal back reference, literal back reference. Same thing here, um, and then same thing here. We just have to keep walking along until something interesting happens. Um, and then finally, <clears throat> I get to a point where ALA, so I'm, I, if I look at my current, my current look ahead begins with A, and I say, have I seen an A before? Well, I've seen one here, and I've seen one here. But what's nice is if I go to this one, I can actually pull in the next two characters, ALA. So I pull those in, I get a back reference of 6, 3, and then I bring in the next literal because I have to. So I now finally get a, 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 this weird triple that actually gives me some sort of compression. Um, you might have noticed in all of that that when I went looking for a back reference, so I have an A and I, I go looking for an A in the past, that I actually had two choices. I could bring in this one or I could bring in this one. And if I make the wrong choice, if I just bring in this one, I end up with the triple of 4, 1, comma, L instead of 6, 3, comma, S because I found one that was close, and there might be reasons a close one's a good idea, but if I keep looking, I might find a better one. And it might be that if I, if I find a collection of 10 of them, I might have to search among those to find the best one. And so you might already see, well, this is foreshadowing something that shows up later, you might already see that there's more to it than just going and looking for the letter A. I, I have to actually optimize my string search. And it gets more complicated when you consider that schemes in practice tend to give an advantage to certain encodings. So a typical one, deflate, for example, on average, although it can vary, on average in deflate, a near back reference with a short, with a short distance is easier to encode um, with fewer bits than a far back reference. The further back into the buffer you go, the more bits you're likely to need, which means you have this weird optimization problem of, is it worth going back 30,000 characters to pull in five, uh, a back reference of length 5 instead of going back 10,000 characters to pull in a back reference of length 3? So there's actually quite a bit of calculus that goes into that. And it starts with just the basic one of, if I have more than one choice of a character to start with, which one do I take? And then we'll, we'll finish the example off. Um, here I can encode this last character as either A by itself as a back reference, so like this, followed by an imaginary end of stream character, which I have to invent. Um, 
or I could, uh, I actually have another option there, which is um, I could encode uh, nothing and then A. And then maybe that, that could signal the end of the stream. But in some cases, we need the end of stream marker. It is worth considering that without this option, I sort of have to have this because I'm required to have a back reference. I, I'm not allowed to just end with a literal, even if it's convenient. I actually have to put something in that back reference field. Maybe it's clear, looking at LZ77, that although it had some neat ideas, it's, th there's a lot to be desired in terms of its actual compression ability. It generates tons and tons of these weird, bloated, meaningless back references that, uh, of course, we have to store somehow um, that will end up negating our compression advantage until we get pretty significant patterns. The slides agree. Um, we ended up with, well, this is all notional because how we store these things depends on a lot of, on a lot of variables, but if we try and figure out what the minimum amount of space to store these triples in given the information we have, let's assume that our characters are 8 bits in size, so 8 bit literal values, and then we think, okay, so each back reference is a pair of distance and length. Um, well, our distance can be anywhere between 1 and 6, so that's 5 different distances, um, or sorry, six different distances, and uh, that means we need we need three bits, so it's we can go from zero to eight, or zero to seven with three bits, so we can do uh, one, one to six. Um, so we need three bits for a uh, distance. For the length, I could conceivably say, go back six characters and then pull in one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve characters. I could have a, a back reference that goes into the future by five characters. So I need four bits for my length. So at, at minimum, uh, if I store them in the regular way, I could use unary or something, which would uh, give a disadvantage to larger um, lengths or distances. Um, but if I try that, maybe I get 15 bits. I think these are a reasonable set of assumptions given the circumstances. Um, so each back reference, each, each triple is 15 bits, and I had 30 characters of input, and if I use 15 bits um, for each, I end up with 18 triples that are 15 bits uh, in size, as opposed to 30 characters that are 8 bits in size, and so I'm significantly exceeding my input size. And you can sort of see that in the sense that a few triples break even, so these ones almost break even, actually a little bit of an advantage. 3, 1, comma, S, I use 7 bits for the back reference and 8 bits for the character. So I actually am saving a tiny bit of space there because of the small sliding window, although in practice my sliding window isn't usually this small. So a few triples give me a little bit of compression, quite a few are a big waste, and some actually, but actually wait, just one, just one gives me any appreciable amount of um, benefit from the full back reference format. If all of my back references were of length one, I could save more space, but uh, the point of having a length and distance is to be able to pull in a large amount of um, care, uh, symbols from the past. So the, the low window size has something to do with it, I guess, because we saw earlier that we could pull in, there's a lot of patterns that do appear more than once, like this, that we could pull in if we had more history to work with. And we could actually do better because we could even pull in things like this, which occurs twice, um, and things like this, or actually, sorry, including the semicolon. So the, the a larger window size improves our um, ability to pull in back references, but then we've got, again, the weird push and pull issue, which is the bigger our window is, the larger the back references are, the more bits we need to store them. Um, so let's try again just to just to prove that point. So I start over, and if I use this window of um, of size eight, I can actually finally now I've I've chosen the size to try and be able to pull in these other things. I can begin pulling, making serious progress on pulling in lots of big things. So I can get um, in this case I get three characters, two characters, four characters. That's looking pretty good. Um, I, I still have some of these bloated, you know, bulky zero length back references. So now I get fifteen triples instead of eighteen. Um, but the triples are a little bit bigger because I have to use a, uh, I have to use a, a, a larger length. I actually get to keep the same distance size because there's only eight, there's only eight possible distances. Um, and a gzip, which you'll see on assignment two, deflate uses 32,000, 32 kilobytes worth of um, history, plus a look ahead of about, I think, 258 characters, strangely. <clears throat> so the issue here is that, um, which which we'll see is a scheme called LZSS, is that LZ77 used this weird format of insisting that we alternate back reference literal, back reference literal, because it made it easier to prove things. It, it, I guess it created a, a sort of advantage. It was more compact. There was only one kind of symbol, this weird triple thing. 
But it's inefficient because we end up with these useless back references where we have to fill space. We just have to put a back reference there because we don't have any other option. We're required to put a trivial one. Um, and so one of the successor schemes, which was called LZSS, notice that and frame the scheme differently so that we have the more natural, you have a bunch of literals, and if you need them, you can throw in a back reference here and there. So LZSS actually expands to Lempel-Ziv, Storer, uh, Storer Szymanski. Um, so I'm just going to go with LZSS for a lot of reasons. Uh, and the idea is they just use an alphabet with two, two types of symbols. There are literals and there are length distance pairs and they can appear in any combination. You're not required to have a back reference if you don't need one. Now the way that they described it, the, like think about this, <clears throat> you're looking at some compressed sequence. How do you know if the next thing you're looking at is going to be a literal 8 bits or a um, length distance pair? What they did was they just figured, we'll add an extra bit to each symbol at the beginning. If it's a zero, you're looking at a literal. If it's a one, you're looking at a length distance pair. So if you see a one as the first bit of the symbol, then you have to parse it like a length distance pair. So what we'll do here is use, um, if we use the same, this is the same settings we had before, we'll end up being able to store length distance pairs in seven bits. But keep in mind, there's an eighth bit added there for the flag that we need to indicate whether we have a length distance pair or not. Um, and like we saw in the earliest examples, we can now just emit back references by themselves. We don't have to. We can have sequences of literals if we want. We could have no back references at all. Um, and it's up to us how we do that. And there are some things, and we noticed one of them in the previous example, some places where strategically not emitting a back reference can be really helpful because you can save up and emit a better back reference later if you don't eat up the, if you don't consume the characters early. <clears throat> So uh, because of the, this window size, this is sort of misleading. We can represent a length distance pair in seven bits, which means plus the flag bit that ends up being eight bits. And that means uh, if a character is eight bits, that and the flag bit is nine bits. So a literal takes nine bits and a length distance pair takes eight, which means our back references of length one are still pretty efficient, which is, which is great. But in practice, we shouldn't expect that. In practice, if our window is big, we should expect back references to be a bit more bulky than individual literals. Um, if we use a window of more characters, so nine characters in this case, we would need, um, for our distance, we would need at least four bits. Um, and then we, in, that, in that case, our pairs require nine bits, which means that it's never really more efficient to encode one of these than it is to encode a literal. And in general, LZSS notices that, and they, they proposed, uh, first off, just in general, don't emit a back reference if a literal, um, uh, ends up actually being, uh, sorry, this, this should say shorter. If we can emit literals and use fewer bits, do that. We want to achieve compression. The issue here is that I'm showing what I can fit on a slide where we might actually have parity between size of back reference and size of literal. That isn't the way it, we should expect it to work in general. The point of having a sliding window is to have a big enough sliding window to be able to find lots of patterns, and that means back references are pretty big. Um, it's worth considering that this is actually not an easy problem to solve um, because it's not as easy as saying, well, hey, our back references are all, let's say, 15 bits in size. So it's easy. If, if we've got a back reference of length two or uh, at least two, then we can save space over literals, which are eight bits in size. Because things like deflate use a different size for different back references, it can be surprisingly difficult to compute whether or not it's worth emitting a back reference. And this is one of the reasons, this idea that the compressor has so many decisions to make, this is one of the reasons that when you get into these high-performance general compression schemes, it's hard because there's so many ways that you can be optimizing and you can't do all of them because there, there isn't enough time um, to exhaustively optimize every possible variable. So LZSS doesn't get enough credit because when people think of LZ77, usually they really think of LZSS. People think LZ77 means, yeah, you got literals, you got back references. But LZ77 proposed a scheme that was pretty difficult and clunky, whereas LZSS pruned it down to something pretty streamlined. And so when we say LZ77, even in the deflate specification where you think they'd know better, we actually usually mean LZSS. Usually, colloquially, the family is referred to as either LZ77 to mean sequences of length distance pairs and literals, or uh, LZW to mean the symbol table version, even though LZW arguably owes the symbol table that it uses to LZ78. So it's a usual, the usual case of um, sort of metonymy. We've seen that before. Um, so I, as, as I mentioned a minute ago, 
this issue of back references sometimes being less efficient than literals is a pretty tough one when we get into these complicated schemes where back references can have variable length encodings. It gets even worse when we consider the fact that deflate not only uses different symbols to store longer back references, it then uses Huffman coding to store those symbols. And that means that if you have back references of length 30,000, or, or sorry, distance 30,000, that those are designed to maybe need more bits. But if you have tons and tons and tons of back references of length 30,000 and very few of length 2, the Huffman coding might end up giving a shorter encoding to distances that are higher because they appear often. That's another dimension of this problem of um, intractable constraints because we have no idea in advance how do we know which back references to emit if we you know if their encoding can affect which ones we should use we don't know how to encode them until we've decided on the back references and so we get this horrible chicken and egg optimization issue and we'll see that we'll talk about that again in the deflate lecture once we've seen exactly what deflate does with these length distance pairs um, and so th this is alluding to that and as I said I'll talk about that later so um, that all said, I mean, the intractability of doing it in a program aside, it's a good exam question to ask you to, to figure it out tractably uh, during an exam given some sort of toy example. So think about that. That's, um, I don't use the, the phrase good exam question on a slide often, so you should know what that means. Um, we've seen earlier, obviously, that one way of, imp of getting an extra boost on our compression, so we talked about this in that topography example, if we get down to a point where we've exhausted our options to um, compress things and we notice that we've got runs of a, of a single character that are all being represented by one bit apiece, bolting on RLE is one easy way of um, getting a boost if we know that there are runs of consecutive things. The point of this slide is to show off that we get RLE for free with Lempel ziv schemes. We don't actually have to worry about it. That's great because whenever you bolt on a new stage, RLE or anything else, you have to justify that the improvements you get when it works, so when you have long runs, are balanced by whatever its performance is when you don't. So it, obviously we know that if you add run length encoding, there will be a case where the data expands. For example, if you don't have lots of runs, if all your runs have length one, something like that. Um, and so it's nice to notice in this case, as I'll show in a minute, that we actually don't need to ever worry about bolting on RLE to a Lempel ziv scheme because it contains that facility already. Um, and that's what this says. So uh, what I want to point out is, let's look at a, a sequence that has a bunch of runs of the same characters, or, or a, one run of the same character repeatedly. So the key here is that overlapping back reference thing from before allows us to basically get run length encoding piggybacking off of the usual back reference thing. So first we emit the A, then we emit the B, and then we take a look. So our current character is about to be this thing. And we go looking. Okay, so I've got a B, or if I want a sequence, I've got a sequence of five Bs. Where have I seen a sequence of five Bs before? Well, I've only emitted two characters. But if I go looking in the past, can I find any sequence of five Bs? Okay, so I go looking one character in the past. Oh yeah, here's a sequence of five Bs. It's this one. And I'm allowed to emit, as long as the back reference goes back by at least one, I'm allowed to emit a sequence that overlaps the current position. And so I do that. So here's my second B, and I go looking for a sequence of five Bs, and my back reference ends up being this thing. Uh, well, that's, that's close enough. Uh, so uh, I'm able to emit this back reference that says go back by one, go forwards from there by five. And you'll, you might notice that's a pretty convenient uh, analog for run length encoding. Uh, I'm just take, taking a run of the same character five times. Notice also that it's sort of similar to that bzip trick where it doesn't bother using the special encoding for runs of length only one. Notice that I don't even bother looking at a run length um, parameter or encoding it or whatever until I've seen the second B in my sequence. Uh, and so in a sense it gives me a lot of the advantages we already saw um, in a vacuum for strict run length encoding schemes. So we shouldn't need to bolt on RLE to a Lempel ziv scheme um, unless it, we're in some weird pathological case like we know we have runs that go far past our look ahead or something or maybe we have runs of a multi-character sequence but the way that the traditional run length encoding would work is basically contained in the definition of Lempel ziv schemes already. Uh, and that's really nice because it means we don't have to worry about the, the implications, the unintended consequences of throwing RLE at our, our uh, compression pipeline. So we, we talked about LZSS, which uh, came through 
from LZ77 as an improvement uh, on the encoding, basically, on it, uh, with a couple of tweaks to the way back references are emitted, but more importantly, getting away from that weird, clunky, triple style um, that was used by LZ77. And really, frankly, for the purposes um, of the rest of the course, we might revisit, like, LZ schemes show up, but we're not going to really have much more to do with LZW and LZ78, but it's significant. We do have to come back around to LZ78 anyway, because we need to talk finally about why LZW works or um, how it fits into the family broadly. So we'll have to go through that example, but it's not the high pressure thing. It'll probably show up on an exam question and we don't see it too often other than that. Uh, and that's because I guess it turns out that the model created by LZ78 and LZW, given the schemes that we tend to use these days with massive amounts of memory and things, they tend to be closer to LZSS. They do use some of the same um, semantics, this idea of a dictionary or symbol table that LZW and LZ78 use. But for the most part, maybe because LZW sort of flopped when with all the patent issues surrounding it, maybe because GZIP and Deflate were successful, for the most part, the, the dominant strain of the family right now is the one uh, on the right, the LZSS family, um, branch of the family. So um, we've already covered LZW, so we're not going to spend too much time on the basics of it, but I do want to talk about um, how LZ78 improved on LZ77, because it made a pretty dramatic change. It was much different than the change made by LZSS. And then maybe we can see finally what LZW really did. We give LZW a lot of credit because it was the basis of those schemes, like Compress, but we'll see that strangely a lot of the, the real intuition behind it, the, real, the, the clever trick it uses, actually is just LZ78. And like LZSS to LZ77, LZW's real innovation was um, the way that the data was stored, uh, uh, avoiding storing things that aren't necessary. And it shouldn't surprise us that we'll actually notice the redundancy we see in LZ78 isn't too different than that we see in LZ77. LZ78 was written, was the follow-up written by Lempel and Ziv themselves. So uh, LZ78 uh, uses a dictionary or a symbol table, and unlike LZW, it starts out empty. So we know from LZW that we pre-initialize the symbol table, um, and LZ78, we start with an empty dictionary. We add one thing. Now, the, the slides, they'll say this, but this one slide is missing it. We add one thing to it, which is at the very beginning, we create a symbol with index 0 that is the empty string. That's it. So we do not pre-initialize all single character symbols to be in the symbol table. We just create one entry, index 0, the empty string. And then what LZ78 is going to do is its output format is going to be a sequence of pairs. The slides will get to this a bit later than I do. A sequence of pairs where each pair consists of the following things. A symbol index and one literal. And when you see such a pair, you should interpret the decompressed data to be the contents of the symbol table at this index plus this literal. So in this case, the pair 0 comma a would be an empty string followed by a, and that's it. Um, when we run, and actually there's another typo in the slides. I swear I'll fix this before I post them. This should actually say not found. When we run LZ78, we start with a working string, and at every, just like in um, LZW, at every point of the algorithm, we're guaranteed that our working string, right here it's empty, our working string is in the symbol table somewhere. And at each step, we take our current character, we stick it at the end of our working string, and we ask, is the result, so in this case, just the single character sequence A, is that in the symbol table? If the answer is yes, we keep going, we set that to be our working string, but in this case, uh, the answer is no, it wasn't found. So we take our augmented string, we add it to the next index of the table, and we then reset our working string to be um, the empty string, because we know the empty string is always in the table. Okay, so we go to the next step, we have this, the character space, we um, add it to our working string, the augmented string is now just the character space by itself, not in the table, so we add it to the table, set our working string to be um, the empty string again, and then we, just like in LCW, I guess I missed this in the last step, we then emit a um, one of these pairs, which consists of the symbol corresponding to our old working string, which was the empty string, so zero, followed by the literal that we just saw, that we had a problem with, the one that we had to reset our string for. 
Um, and so the slides are slowly getting to the same point I've gotten to. It writes a pair i comma c, where i is the index of the old working string and c is the new character if it didn't find the new thing. Um, and then we, at each step, we also, just like in LZW, we add the augmented working string, so the ith entry of the symbol table plus the new character, we add it at the next available index. And the working string is always reset to be empty, not to be a single character like it is in LZW. So here, I'm going to walk along a bit further before something interesting happens. So here we take L, it hasn't been seen before, we add it to the dictionary, we emit the pair 0, comma L. Um, here we see the character A. We add it to our working string, we look at the character A that results, the single character string, it's in the dictionary. So we're good. Um, and so we set our working string, just like in LZW, we set our working string to be the A, and we keep going. We don't emit anything. Then we see the character S, we take a look at the string AS, doesn't exist in the dictionary, so we add it to our dictionary. We then emit a pair, because every time we hit a not found, we have to emit a new pair. Our pair is going to be the index of our old working string, which was A, so index 1, followed by the literal we just saw. And you might notice that every time we hit a not found, we add something to the symbol table and we emit one of these pairs. And in fact, the set of pairs gives us basically a journal of all the stuff we added to the symbol table. We can reconstruct the symbol table from the pairs. Here's index, so index 0 would be the empty string. Index 1 is whatever's in index 0 plus A, okay, that's A. Index 2, the next one is whatever's in index 0 plus a space, yep. There's whatever's in index 0 plus L, there it is. Whatever's in index 1 plus an S, okay, so that's A plus S. So that's one thing to keep in mind. And you might remember from LZW, we didn't seem to need that property, but we have that here. So here our working string is, uh, we're looking at the second S, so that's this. Uh, we take the S, add it to the empty string, we don't see it. And so interestingly, the single character S actually gets added after the two character sequence AS. And we keep doing that for a little while. Here we find a space, and we see space A, so that's this. We add it to the table here, and we emit the index of the old working string, which was the space, so that's index 2, and the literal we just saw, 2 comma A. And this describes the, the string, whatever's in index 2, a space, plus an A, and that's what ends up here. And we keep doing this for a while. I'm not going to belabor this. You can sort of see what's going on here. Um, I'm going to see if we can find ourselves. I think it's symbol 16 that I want. Okay, so here's something interesting happening finally. We have um, a working string LA, which we know is in the table because we're guaranteed that our working string is always in the table. Uh, it's at index 13. We try appending an S to it. We now have a three-character augmented working string, not in the table, so we add it, and we emit the pair 13, comma, S. And so notice that every time we emit something, we are signaling A, that we're adding something to the table. B, that the literal that we're tacking on to the end of that is the one in the pair. So for example, we just added something to the table ending in an S, so we put an S in our pair here. Previously, we appended the value uh, semicolon space A, and we, uh, that ended in A, so we put the A there. And we know that every single pair, which has a literal as its second element, every single pair in our compressed output corresponds to adding one thing to the symbol table. What we can observe, though, is that maybe we don't need that first element of the pair. If you're following along, so if you're the decompressor and you're following along, maybe, I mean, I tell you, for example, yeah, take um, whatever's at index 13, add an S. What do I really mean? What I really mean was that my old working string was whatever's at index 13. If I'm the decompressor, maybe I already know that. And so uh, there are cases, and it's not, it's not um, cut and dry, and that CSCSC problem is one example why, but there are cases where you don't necessarily need to see that information. And so the biggest example I think I can point out is certainly uh, one of these. So, okay, 0 comma D. Well, okay, you just emitted something and then you see a D and there's nothing before it. Well, I would argue that you don't need to tell me that index 0 is the empty string. I can deduce that. I know because my working string was the empty string before. Um, and so we, we might observe that uh, as I go through this, I don't need all of the information in these pairs. And certainly I don't need those zeros. Just like in LZ77, I didn't need those zero length back references. And so we'll, we'll cut to the end of this. So we have a lot of similarities to LZW in that we have a symbol table and that each step that we add something, we are taking an existing symbol table entry, so LA, 
We're adding an S to it. Here we took L, which is up here, and we added an A to it. We're tacking on one character. And we know, uh, grad students in the audience certainly know that there is a clever way of storing the symbol table that avoids storing the full string at each step. And that's because it leverages this characteristic. Um, where in LZ78, we don't have the, the workaround that LZW does, where we're allowed to just use literals um, by themselves because they're already in the symbol table. We have to add them to our symbol table ourselves. So there's A, and then S gets added, and D, the single character D and the single character K, they get added way down here because they're not in the table to begin with. Um, so uh, it's also worth considering, yeah, these are obviously no good because that zero means nothing and we're wasting the, the sort of the index um, element of the pair saying that there's an empty string. This isn't so bad because our, our assuming that our dictionary indices are encoded in a relatively small number of bits, we, we are encoding two characters with this pair, but we may appreciate that likely our indices are bigger than eight bits and so it's still probably better to encode literals here if we can avoid it, um, avoid encoding the pair. Um, and the key observation to make is that every pair I emit is basically me saying, here's where I cleared my working string, here is where I added my element to the dictionary. And we can make an argument that if we follow the decompression process, like we do in LCW, where we don't have to keep emitting these zero things, or we don't actually have to emit back reference symbols in, unless we're legitimately reusing a, a, a non-trivial symbol from the past, we don't need to do it for symbols of length um, one. So in this case uh, here, the letter A, we don't need to emit as a back reference. We can just emit it by itself. We certainly don't need to do it for this. Um, the key here is that LZ78 gives us more information than we need to decompress. And so uh, this is, I think, the most uh, concise example from early in this sequence. But basically here I uh, emit the pair, um, I'm going to get rid of this, I emit the pair 1 comma s, and that's me adding something to the symbol table, whatever's in element 1 plus an s, great. You would know. If you saw this, you're like, okay, so um, that's where he uh, emitted, he added something to the symbol table, and he cleared his working string. Every time I see a pair, I have cleared the working string. Great. Then you see this, and you're like, okay, so you took nothing, that's element zero, and you added an S. Yeah, I, I knew that. I knew you had nothing. I just cleared my working string. You don't need to tell me that. So notice that that's obviously redundant. It's not the only place redundancy might manifest, but it's obviously redundant. The decompressor would look at this and say, yeah, you're, you're, you're kidding. Of course you didn't, you didn't use any other characters. I didn't see you use anything else. I'm sitting here with an empty working string just like you are. I don't need you to tell me that my working string is empty. And so the key insight that Welch had um, was basically that we don't need to give the decompressor all that information. We need to give some of it. We need to, for example, when we do use a multi-character back reference, a multi-character entry of my symbol table, like this one, we do certainly have to say what I did. You can't expect the decompressor to read my mind. But we do not need to keep encoding it every single time we do anything. We can allow the decompressor to keep up with us by running our own algorithm itself. Um, and so basically we do still have to emit back references or these, these indices in some cases, but not in all cases. And that was the key insight uh, of LZW. So that's one thing. And so we need to know about that. We have to understand that a lot of the mechanics of LZW, the basic idea of the symbol table and using the symbol table indices and adding new stuff as we go, that isn't LZW's innovation, that's LZ78. Just like LZSS with LZ77, the key development of LZW was finding a clever way of uh, representing the result without wasting tons of space on redundant information. Now that's one thing, but we also have to consider, just like we talked about with LZW, the big issue with this symbol table approach is um, it's encoding things sort of defensively. When we work with LZSS, we only add a back reference when we see a pattern for the second time, which means we don't waste space encoding patterns that we're never going to see again. With LZ78 and LZW, we keep adding these symbols to the symbol table. I've only seen this text. I have no idea what's coming up. It could be a bunch of completely, like it could be XYZ, XYZ, XYZ for the rest of the string. But I've added all this stuff to the symbol table. I've used up space in my symbol table, which of course translates to memory wasted, but also bits that I need to encode indices. And I have no guarantee I'm ever going to need any of these symbols again. And so that's a big disadvantage because it wastes memory on, on, the, on the front of resources taken by the decompressor. But it also means that I need to probably use more bits for my indices because I'm going to have a lot of junk sitting in my table. Both schemes have that problem. And 
When we talked about LZW, I justified that by saying because we do that, we don't have to worry about how I tell you when to put something in the table. The decompressor does the same thing the compressor does. That's an advantage of that. And it was one of the reasons LZW was such a clever idea in 1985. Um, but these days, when we don't necessarily um, need that performance advantage of having to both do something very fast and with low bandwidth, we can do things like optimize bandwidth further, not generating back references to things we don't need to, and finding clever ways to encode back references and keep huge amounts of history in our buffer, um, and not necessarily rely on a scheme like this where we end up wasting a lot of our um, uh, symbol table on things we're not going to use again. Now the converse of that, just to be clear why that might have been nice in 1985, is that when I work with LZ77 or LZSS with a massive window, so LZMA might use gigabytes of data, then I have to store all that stuff. I can only go back as many characters as I have. An interesting point to make here, although th there is some nuance to it beyond what I'm saying, so I'm, I may be selling some snake oil here, but it's worth considering. Once I add something to index four of the table, it's just in there. I, I, if I ever reuse that pattern, I, I don't have to worry how far in the, few, in the far, how far in the past it, it came from. I just reuse it. Um, and so maybe that's helpful. So for example, uh, in this scheme, LAS doesn't actually get added to the table until I get all the way to that point. But if I added LAS as a back reference with LZSS, I would have to say, okay, go back by you know, 10 or 20 characters or whatever. I have to actually have in my history, I have to have LAS in there somewhere. I have to go find it. If it's 10,000 characters in the past, I have to have a buffer of that size and know how to search it effectively. In this scheme, because I've defensively added stuff to my symbol table, it's already there. If I ever have the opportunity to reuse a pattern. The pattern was already put in my symbol table when I first saw it. So I don't have to worry. I front-loaded the task of figuring out where the pattern is. If I ever need a pattern, I just go look at my symbol table and there it is. I don't need to worry about how far away it is or anything else. I just find it in my symbol table. Um, and that has its advantages, which is that my symbol table gets overfilled. And as I've said, the weight of history tends to have come down on the side of I'd rather just keep a gigabyte of history um, of previous characters than necessarily have this big bloated symbol table constructed by such a deterministic algorithm. We've noticed that it is nice that the compressor gets to make those decisions. It has the trade-off. Do I go looking for a back reference far into the past or not? Do I go looking for a long back reference or will I settle for a short one? For whatever reason, um, in schemes more recent than LZW, that has been the preference. And maybe it's because computing power has increased dramatically since then, and so we've had more cycles to throw at that task. And of course, we've also discovered much more efficient ways of representing data, and we have different constraints than they did back then. We've got a lot more um, main memory to play with, and so we can have more space to represent extremely complex structures that we may not have been able to represent uh, back in the age of LZW. Um, so that's all well and good. We've talked about the schemes, but what we're maybe here for is if the, if the future in the course is talking about deflate, if that's our big issue on assignment two, then um, w what does it mean to implement LZSS? Not what is LZSS, but if I have a, a window of 32,000 things, how do I find back references in that? Um, now, deflate has more to it than that. So it uses LZ, it uses LZ77. Wow, I made that mistake. It uses LZSS. It calls it LZ77, but it's actually LZSS um, coding and Huffman coding and a bunch of weird stuff to be able to compactly represent code tables. Um, but maybe we should just talk about how it does the, L the Limple Ziv part of it. So if I have a large window, which 32K is large, I guess, compared to our examples today, but keep in mind that that's not the big show. LZMA is able to use a sliding window that is effectively gigabytes in size. We need some way of searching it and finding good back references. So what I really want is this. I, I'm going to write this in a formal notation. So I am at C0. That's my next character. And I have a window, and we'll call them, you know, we'll index a sequence by negative numbers, c negative 1, c negative 2, up to c negative uh, n minus 1, c negative n. That's my history of length n. And then I've got some look ahead of k characters. What I would like is a pair, if it exists, of um, a starting index q and a length l of the longest possible sequence. Um, that gives me, so in this case what it's saying is I would like C0, C1 up to, let's say, uh, well I guess it would be C0 plus 
um, L to match CQ. So CQ equals C0, the current character. CQ plus 1 equals C1. Whoops. CQ plus 1 equals C1, the next character. I would like to find somewhere in my history a subsequence that matches some prefix of my future set of characters. That is the formal definition of the problem that I want to solve. Now, what I want to do now is only give a few hints here. I want to give some suggestions. There are a lot of ways of tackling this, and there's no real specific formal method that's the best. Um, in assignment two, if you go this way with the, the performance data structures way, um, you'll have a lot of leeway to decide how you optimize. And in many cases, it won't be about choosing some sort of asymptotically optimal data structure. It'll be about optimizing for generating, let's say, good back, refer back references, not the best ones, good ones, um, in a reasonable amount of time. Maybe it's too slow to always find the best, um, but instead you can find one that's pretty good pretty fast. So that's one thing to remember. You have control. You can just decide how many back references, if any, you generate. Um, and you can choose to generate bad ones. You could generate a back reference of only length 5 when there might be one out there of length 10. Or you could only go back a certain amount in the history or look for shorter and shorter ones the further back you go or something like that. So we want to find as many and as long back references as possible. But we can always attenuate our expectations if it turns out that our data structures are too slow. So the basic option, the one you all better try, is use linear search. You're, you're standing at C0, just begin walking backwards and looking for strings that are similar. That'll work. It'll be slow, but that'll work. Um, and you might find that if you make the right compromises and you rely on some amount of random chance or you're clever in the way you store your sequences, that can be pretty good. It can, it can generate pretty good compression. And then, you know, as usual, maybe you expect, the law of diminishing returns kicks in. You don't get um, that big of an improvement by finding the best one versus a very good one because you don't generally have too many cases where there are multiple choices for a back reference. And so you want to optimize for the typical case. So the official advice of the course is you better start with linear search. I don't want to find out people have been staying up all night writing binary search trees if they haven't just gotten the code to work with some basic algorithm first. Um, an improved option is this. What you could do is you could view your, your single long history buffer as actually a set of basically n separate strings. Now you could do a clever trick where you store them all in one buffer, but you, you use pointers or something to treat them like they're separate strings. So now you have a collection of n completely distinct strings, right? Here's a string going back all the way by n characters forward into your history. Here's a string going back by only one character and then forward into your history. Uh, all the way through. Maybe the back reference you find is only a prefix, only the first two characters or whatever of one of these strings, but certainly any back reference you find, the beginning of the back reference will be the beginning of one of this collection of strings, this sort of notional collection. Now that you've turned one long buffer into n independent strings, you could attempt to throw them into a regular data structure, a binary search tree or something. So a, a, an obvious one, if you know there is a back reference, is just put all of these strings into a binary search tree. Um, you can get a nice one out of the C++ standard library, and then just do a find operation to go grab the one that matches your, your current string. Now, you'll, you'll, you may notice, I'll point out in the coming slides, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but that certainly is an option. So um, STD set and STD map in C++ are both self-balancing binary search trees. Um, and so suppose this is a contrived example. It's not actual substrings. There are just too many of them to be able to show that here. Um, but if I have a binary search tree with these contents, I can find maybe the best match, if not uh, a perfect match, if I know how to look. So it's not as obvious if I'm looking for, um, suppose I'm looking for A, B, C, D. You might notice A, B, C, D isn't actually in this binary search tree. So if I go searching for ABCD, it'll just come back with no results. But what I could do is I could go looking for where I would put ABCD and see if anything nearby is close enough. Because I might notice, hey, yeah, AB, that gives me something. And then there's ABA. I could use one of those. Maybe this one is closer to me. Maybe it's a, at a shorter distance. Maybe I want to just recycle that. Um, so if I have them all in a binary search tree, I can use binary search tree find logic, not out of the box, but similar logic, to be able to find close substrings. So what I basically want to do is I want to figure out where would I insert A, B, C, D in this tree if I had to insert it. Uh, I probably would stick it somewhere around here. 
So if I go iterate through the tree, if I do a traversal to find the insertion point, I could then wander around nearby that insertion point. I don't actually want to insert it, but I want to know what's nearby. Hey, there's ABB, that's close. And then what's before it, ABA, that could work. AC, that's not going to work. That's uh, only length one, I probably don't want that. Um, so here, A, B, C, D, it doesn't work. I find the insertion point, and then I, I look around. I don't know how many I'd have to look around. There could be, these could be very long substrings, but I look around there to find the best match. I could certainly rule out a lot of the tree by doing that. Um, and the amount you look around, that's one of those, those, uh, in, those specific factors that you might control for performance. The larger of a search in the neighborhood you do, the more likely you find the best match versus a match, but of course the longer that takes, because you might be doing effectively linear search. Um, another improved option, which I'm just going to suggest at the very end here, is you could um, use a, a sort of hashing scheme. Now, we have to be careful about this. The reason I suggested a binary search tree is it does keep related substrings close to each other. So if you need to look around at similar substrings, they're all near each other. The whole point of a hash table is to do the opposite. If I throw a bunch of input at a hashing scheme, even if it's similar, in fact, arguably, especially if it's similar, it is supposed to spread it out everywhere. It's supposed to keep it apart. Um, and we saw that with a binary search tree, we can't use it in the obvious traditional way, the find operation for what we want, because we don't want the, the perfect match. We probably won't get that. We want the best match, a, a decent match. Um, you know, even if we don't want the, can't find the best one, just something, but hopefully the best one. The same thing is a, is a problem with hash tables. We're not going to find the exact string we're looking for. We just want some substring in the history that's, that's got a few characters in common with our, with our look-ahead buffer. Um, and so we need to, we can use a hashing scheme for that, but we need a little bit of finesse. So one option would be, well, hey, a well-designed hashing scheme um, is designed to spread all the strings out. So why just, why not use a badly designed hashing scheme? Let's take a good hashing scheme and break it. So one option would be, I could think, hey, well, I know that I'm only looking for back references of length, let's say three or four, or, or maybe more than four, but not like length one. So what I could do is I could use a hash table where I deliberately don't consider any more than, let's say, the first three elements of a string. So that means that every string, A, B, C, A, B, C, D, A, B, C, 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 D, all of those end up being um, collisions because the hashing scheme only ever considers the first three characters. But on the other hand, you know, B, C, A, that's kept separate because that will get a separate ha hash value if we play our cards right. So what I could do is I could deliberately subvert the hashing scheme logic to just batch together related strings. Uh, and in fact, if, if you think about it carefully, you could make a table which is big enough for there to be a unique index for every possible three character string if characters are eight bits apiece. And that'll require um, 16 million locations or maybe 64 megabytes of memory if you use four bit pointers or four uh, byte pointers. Um, and then you would have legitimate, like not just that, that usual expected case, legitimately worst case constant time lookup. Uh, of course, all the strings, so we saw a minute ago ABC, ABCC, ABCD, all of those end up stuck in the same bucket of the hash table. But maybe there aren't very many of them, and maybe you have a scheme to control how many are in there. Once you find all the strings with a given three-character prefix, um, you're guaranteed you have at least one back reference. You now have at least something in there could help you. You choose how to process everything in that bucket. So if you use, let's say, chaining for your hash table, so you have one bucket per possible three-character prefix, and then inside the bucket you have one element for each um, actual substring in your history, you could then choose how you search the bucket. You could use a different data structure. You could choose to do a limited search, a randomized search. Um, but there are various ways you could exploit a hash table. And that's actually what the real gzip encoder does. It uses a, a, a sort of limited, clever hashing scheme and then resolves all of the, the minutia of back references. So suppose length longer than five or something, the less likely back references to occur, um, it resolves those basically by brute force, by linear search, because of the assumption that we don't tend to see too many back references that are that big or that far in the past. It's more likely to see ones that appeared sooner and that were relatively short. So in general, our constraints, what we have to think about is not just can we find the back references, but there's also a couple of other constraints that have to do with this vague sort of streaming-esque requirement that we have, which is that, yeah, my Windows 
you know, 32,000 characters. I'm going to store a bunch of uh, future input, but I want to be able to throw something out if it gets too old, if it gets stale, and bring in new characters easily. So that means if a character exits my sliding window because it's too far back, it's never going to appear in a back reference, I need to have some way of getting it out of my data structure because otherwise it's going to eat up more and more memory and become intra it's going to, it's just going to My machine will run out of memory eventually if on a massive input. And that's the biggest issue there. Not only will it make my search slower if I've got a bunch of junk in there I'm never going to need, I'm going to end up running out of memory. I also need an easy way to fold in new data. If my substrings are always changing because I'm adding new characters to the end of them, I need some way of being able to throw them in, throw in new characters as I learn them, and have my data structure somehow accommodate that, either by not caring in an, in a, an educated way, not caring in a way that doesn't ruin the search performance or the accuracy of a search, or by dynamically adjusting the structure as new characters come in. Um, this is something, though, that is pretty specific to each implementation. So we'll talk about that a bit more, um, more of a, tu a tutorial-style discussion as we go forward. Um, but we should know enough about LZ schemes now to know first why they're helpful, why we like back references and things, why we want to limit that sliding window to something that allows us to, to manage what back references we can generate, but also why um, there are quite a few performance implications of having large windows even if we want them, even if we want to have back references that go far back. It's pretty tough to wrangle all of the different possible substrings into a format where we can search them effectively. So we know that. We know that deflate uses it. We know that deflate has all sorts of other scary stuff happening. Um, so we, we can't delay it anymore. So we have to push onwards to that deflate lecture.